Hello. Ooh. Hi there. Is that really loud? Anyway. So all I can say is I thought my worst fear was speaking in front of people. Until I got the call. And it was good news. And the good news was I was speaking in front of people. And then I realized that my worst fear is saying no to the Lord. Can't say no to the Lord. He's definitely brought me way too far that I can't allow anything to get in the way of what I know that he's calling me to do. And so, if you get the call of the good news, <laughs> don't run away from the Lord. He's got so much for you. So, here we go. Jesus, you're on. All right, so Pastor talked about um, true disciples uh, last Tuesday. So, as I was um, listening to... Or, eating that word, I heard true worshipers in my spirit. I heard that true disciples are true worshipers. But you spell worshipers, W-A-R, shippers. Because <laughs> they war for God's presence. So I wrote, true worshipers war in the spirit, not each other. True worshipers war for the Lord, and not themselves. True worshipers fight for God's presence and not over his words. True worshipers know who they are in Christ, and they have no need to prove themselves to anyone. True worshipers are present seekers, not distracted tweakers. True worshipers keep unity in the faith. They do not sow discord among the brethren. True worshipers are fighters for freedom, and they don't have time for useless arguments. True worshipers have a relationship with the person of God, and they are not religious robots. So let's all turn to Psalms 14.2. I just keep hearing in my spirit the Lord saying, where are they? Like, Where are they? Where are my true worshipers? And um, then I hear us say, here we are, Lord. <laughs> they're at true. Um, but they're everywhere. There are a lot of true worshipers. We're not the only ones. It's not about a specific church or a specific people group. It's all about where the, Lord, where the Lord brings you. Like what He takes you out of and where He brings you. So anyways, in Psalms 14.2, it says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand or who seek Him. And I wanted to read out of um, the Passion Translation because um, you can just write Psalms 53, 2 through 6, because it say, says basically the same thing, but I really appreciate the visual that you get through the Passion Translation, because it says, The Lord looks down in love, and He's bending over heaven's balcony. God looks over all of Adam's sons and daughters, looking to see if there are any wise with insight, any who search for Him, wanting to please Him. But no, all have wandered astray walking stubbornly toward evil. So basically, the Lord is looking for present seekers. You don't have time to waste on anything else but seeking His presence, especially at this time. Because this is a high time of evil right now, and people are evenly, are 
easily being led astray. Um, and he's looking for the ones, he's looking for lovers of God, the ones who love him, the ones who want to spend time with him, the person, him. Um, and he's, he's basically letting us know that if we don't spend time in his presence with him, we're not going to get to know him and we're not going to get to understand his ways. So make sure that you take this opportunity while you're here and from here on out every day, all day to seek his presence in everything you do. You acknowledge him all the time. <clears throat> John 4, 23 through 24. It's like that song, Run. I think it's cool because the words say, like, why do you run? Why do you hide? He's looking down, and you're just sitting there watching TV, or you're on Facebook. <laughs> and he's like, don't you know, I just want to be with you, to be with you. And until you make the decision to go spend time in his presence and sit quietly and still, you're never going to know what it's like on the other side you'll stay stuck in religion. So, John 4, 23 through 24. <clears throat> um, hold on a second. But the hour is coming. And now, I hear that word now, is the time when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we learn here, in order to get in the spirit, guess what you got to do? You got to sow in the Spirit. If you don't sow in the Spirit, you're not going to reap the Spirit. And if you don't reap the Spirit, guess what? You're stuck in self. <laughs> and who wants to be stuck in self? Because self is the old man. Self is double-minded in all his ways. Self is delusional. Self is stuck in deception. Self thinks... He knows it all when he don't know nothing without the Lord. So, in order to have understanding, we must seek his presence. So, let's go to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Okay, we're going to read this together. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. This is the most important thing. If you're going to get anything, you better put on your armor. If you don't got your armor on, guess what? <laughs> you're going to fall. You will not stand against the wiles of the devil without the full, whole armor of the Lord. Not just a piece here and there. It's the whole armor every day. If you don't do anything, at least put your armor on. All right, here goes. Let's read this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shields of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, praying always in the spirit. You will not be a watchman because you will not see if you do not pray in the spirit. I'll never forget. Actually, David, I think this is cool because I'll never forget when I was in the discipleship house, I, um, I heard David say, you know, he used to drill us about praying in the spirit and we used to have quiet time, an hour of quiet time. So something inside of me, and that something, you know, is the Holy Spirit telling you to do it, um, told me, you know what, I'm going to start taking my hour of quiet time and just drill it. I'm just, I knew, because the Spirit of God tells you all things, I knew on the inside that if I sowed in the Spirit and just prayed in tongues for, you know, I knew I, knew I was going to get somewhere. I was going to get to the other side. And there is another side. Because, of course, we all know we got to, like, press through ourselves. And, boy, when you start praying in the Spirit, you're like a machine gun. You get filled with the Holy Ghost. You're empowered. Your mind's clear. All the other garbage of the world falls away. And you also start seeing what God sees. Like he starts showing you um, people, places, and things to pray for. And then if you just have your eyes closed and then he shows you, like gives you a target and you were praying his perfect will when we pray in the spirit, why wouldn't you pray in the spirit? Hello? <laughs> and a lot of times, I know it's hard for me to like, like, um, what's the word? like come up with words to pray in the natural, like with what I, because sometimes your emotions are in a way, this gets your emotions out of the way, okay? And then it's just, you're just, you see a target and you're praying his perfect will. It don't really get any better than that. And God's not boring either. That's another thing. You don't need TV. You really don't because you don't need to watch the news. You don't need to find out what's going on on the news when you close your eyes and you fix your eyes on the face of the Lord and you just drill it, boy, he'll bring everything. Like he'll bring everything to you. And it's from him. It's not your stuff. That's the big difference. So let's go to um, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. talking to me about the armor and the oil. The armor and the oil. The armor and the oil. He keeps saying to me, the armor is a non-negotiable. You can't play any games if you don't put on your armor. And then the oil represents the Holy Spirit. So you need your armor and you need to buy your own oil. So Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Let's read this together. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for the lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those and sell and buy for yourselves. 
And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and then the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And all I can say is that would be the most terrorizing thing to have the door shut in your face. To have the um, Lord say, I don't know you. Like, think about that. Um, and the whole point of buying your oil, it's not about, like, we're so blessed to have come to this, like, God brought us here. Everybody here, like, there's no doubt. Get all the doubts out. You're not, like, nobody chooses to come here. We're all here because of the Lord. So how dare you walk away from his plan? Okay? And he brought us here to teach us, to train us. This is the school of the Spirit. It's all about the Spirit. The new covenant is Jesus. Jesus is the Spirit, the resurrected Spirit of God. It's not about dead works. It's not about, um, you know, just the letter. Um, it's about your relationship with the Lord. And so take this opportunity to cultivate while you're here so that you can continue because we're going to be with him in eternity. So you might as well just get it together now and start practicing just like being with him. Think about it. Think about how like many like distractions, like it's just like there's so much noise caving in. There's so much, so many distractions. You literally, like we learn about um, um, discipline leads to a love affair. Um, but then your discipline, like it, 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 your love affair with the Lord, like as you practice things, then you'll end up becoming like, it'll be like a delight. It'll, it'll turn into a delight because you may not be, you know, you may not be there. Like, I know I never knew the Lord my whole life. So this is where I was taught every, I was, I always say I was born and raised at True. <laughs> I wasn't born and raised at, in Rhode Island or I was born and raised at True. And I learned so much about um, just being with the Lord and buying my own oil, not just during um, our services, but on your own. Go get them. Go get them, tigers. All right, so Matthew 6, 5 through 8. All right. I love this. Are we ready? And when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, and that they may be seen by men. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their main words, many words. Therefore, do not be like them. I hear that loudly. For your Father knows the things you have need for before you ask Him. The secret place. That is the place of intimacy. This is a place where you become undistracted. And you can find a place, because even when I was being discipled, and I, I know you live in a home with many people, you can still go in the backyard and find a corner somewhere. I mean, do what you got to do. When I started riding my bike, boy, that was my secret place. Um, but it's a place where, like, when he says shut the door, that means go somewhere, like you're, you're being purposeful to meet with the Father. 
okay? So you don't bring a phone. You don't bring anything that's going to distract you. You know that you have no strings attached. You don't have to be anywhere. Like you set aside a time and a place to be with the Father, and that's it. Because if you don't, again, sow quietness and stillness, you're not going to reap it. You're always going to have noise and busyness and distractions. And you'll never hear what the Lord has to say to you. And plus, the secret place is where you find your identity. Because you're face to face with the Lord. And He reflects His face onto you. And you start looking like Him and sounding like Him. And being like Him. And that's what God wants to do. Like He wants to... That's his whole plan is to transform us into his image because the world is lost and dying. Just like when we were lost and dying, they need to see Jesus. They need to see kindness and they need to see, they just need to see something different from the world. Um. Let's go to, oh, I just wanted to give you this scripture. You don't have to go there because I think it's pretty cool. Um, it's Colossians 4.2 in the Passion Translation. I just like the way it reads. It says, be faithful to pray as intercessors who are fully alert in giving thanks to God. And true worshipers, that's what they are. I hear pastors been saying that quite often. Like, we need to be alert. We need to be awake. <sighs> We need to wake up. We can't fall asleep. We can't sleep on the job, basically. We got a job to do. Like, if you think about, like, if you, he's been, the Lord's been flooding me too with remembrance of all the things that he's brought me out of. Like, when you worship, like, Father, our pastor says, don't let one word fall to the ground. Boy, because when you worship and you say every one of those words but you need to close your eyes and you need to connect with the Lord in your heart and you need to get everything else out of the way but when you start doing that like when you're heart to heart with the Lord then he'll start bringing a remembrance everything that he's brought you through because we easily forget and you need to remember where you came from so that you can stay grateful because a grateful heart boy will take you to the top. Um, but it keeps you um, humble. That's what a grateful heart does. It keeps you humble. Because you, I always used to say, boy, when you become humiliated, I've been humiliated a lot out there. When you become humiliated, that will definitely humble you. But God's cleaned us up and brought us here um, to transform our hearts to be pure and to be filled with Him so that we can pray for the ones that are still out there and that are lost. Um, all right, I want to go to... I don't know how much time I have. I want to go to Isaiah 57. I love the picture that this scripture paints. It says, For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. True worshipers, they set their face like flint. And I think it's really cool because that setting your face like flint Flint means that you are fixed and you are focused on Jesus. You don't have any time for any games. You don't have time for nonsense. You don't have time for arguments. Um, and all you have time for is what matters to the Lord. Um, and Flint, I think this is cool because Flint means like steel. So is they look... Okay, when you set your face like Flint, a true worshiper, they look adversity in the eye. And they are hardened against all opposition. They are resolute 
and they are undaunted. They are constant and they are unmoved by the words and the blows of men. They are untouchables. Men don't move them. Only the spirit of the living God will move them. So they practice letting go of offense quick. They let it go because all offense does is open doors to every other unclean spirit and it will clog you up. You will not see and you will not hear and you will think that you see and you will think that you hear, but you're not. You're pretty much under a like a deaf and dumb spirit. <laughs> can't see, can't hear, don't know where you're going. All right, so I wanted um, to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 20. And I... 1 Corinthians. It says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Everybody say, I'm alive and kicking. (laughs) I'm alive in Christ. And I'm kicking out the demons. So, but um, I think this is so cool because I have a little, um, like, list of the contrast, the differences between, because we're living in the new covenant, okay? So what the new covenant is, plain and simply, is it's, it's in the spirit. It's in the spirit of Jesus. And the old covenant is the letter, so I'm going to just give you 10 um, contrasts, 10 differences of what it's like to be in the Old Covenant, which if you live um, Old Covenant-minded, you're bound by the letter. But if you live in the New Covenant, okay, you're alive in Christ. The Spirit of Christ is in you. You're empowered. So here it is. I got um, the Old Covenant are letters only. And letters, they only communicate knowledge. This is dead. They do not have the ability to make you live. Um, Number two, uh, referred to in the Bible, they're referred to in the Bible as tablets of stone. The letters, letter is tablets of stone. Stone is cold, hard, heavy, lifeless. Um, The tablets of stone, they're referred to as a ministry of death. They're not able to impart life. Um, it, the only glory that the old covenant had was only because, you know, of God. Um, and it only served its purpose for the time, like when it's communicated, but then it fades away because the spirit was not there. The letter veils the eyes of understanding. There's no spirit of wisdom there. There's no spirit of understanding. There's no revelation. You cannot see and you are blind. The letter hardens your heart because the spirit of understanding is not there. Um, People that are letter like bound, um, they internally have no presence of God. They don't carry the presence of God. And so they portray outwardly like they're living holy. Um, it's, it's like, what is it? Um, we're, we're like, you're denying the, I can't remember how that goes. Huh? Form of godliness and denying the power. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Exactly. So this, um, and this is an issue in Christianity because this is old covenant thinking. You're bound by the letter. So the new covenant is the spirit. It's the presence of God. The presence of God is what gives you life. The presence of God is, is what's able to help you walk out your life and overcome. 
Um, the presence of God is what puts desires in your heart to empower you to overcome and to do the things that he wants you to do, not in your own understanding. The presence of God, um, he, he transforms your heart and he writes his word in your heart. Um, and the presence of God is, in the new covenant is the ministry of righteousness. It's not the ministry of death. You're walking in his righteousness because he died for you to make you right with him through the power of his spirit. Um, and the new covenant is a much greater glory because of the fact that it is the manifestation of the person of Christ. It remains forever. It doesn't fade away. Like the letter, you'll hear it. There's not like there's information communicated. You hear it and then it fades away. But the spirit is from God speaking directly to you and you will never forget what God tells you. You'll never forget. Think about your, all the experiences you've had with the Lord. Things that you'll just never forget because that's from him. Your father, your dad speaking directly to you through his spirit. And the new covenant, it's liberty. You're free. Um, you're in, in the new covenant, you behold the Lord. You are face to face and you receive. That's a key word. To receive his person. Like that's what we do when we praise and worship. We sow and then we receive his presence. We let his presence sink into our hearts and transform our hearts. And only in his presence are our hearts changed and transformed and our minds renewed. Only. You can read the word all day long, but if you don't have the presence of the Lord, and the only way you get the presence is pressing through yourself and sowing in, the, sowing in his presence, that's the only way that your heart will change and your mind will be renewed. And that's why people are so like deaf and dumb and think that they're okay. But they're not because the presence is not there. Um, and then lastly, um, the new covenant, you're being transformed from glory to glory. There are just too many people in the New Covenant walking with Old Covenant thinking. <clears throat> old Covenant thinking people are always trying to strive to prove themselves. Um, they're just striving and they're performing and they're trying to prove themselves. And the New Covenant is all you got to do is receive the love of God that He died to give to you. And that's it. It's really simple. And it's wonderful. So I think I'm going to end here with, let's see, bear with me. All right, I think I am going to end with um, the things... Um, not to do, like if you're a true worshiper, okay, the things that we don't want to do. Hold on, sorry. I have a um, scripture that it's actually from the Amplified. I shared this in one of our Saturday morning meetings, but I just think it's so wonderful. I just want everybody to write this down. at 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 17, um, and 23 and 24. But this is the amplified version. version. So um, it's very like thorough and descriptive, and it paints a, a picture of what not to do. Um, you know, because the thing is, is we're called here to walk in the spirit, not in religion. And just know that a religious spirit basically is just uh, pride and fear. And pride and fear partner. And basically what pride says is, I know it all. I know more than God. You don't want to be like that. And then fear says, oh my gosh, I'm afraid everyone's going to find out that I don't know it all. So that's what they do. And you don't want to be like that. 
Um, so I'm going to just read this to you. And um, this is from the Lord. These are instructions and warnings of what not to do. He says, remind the people of these facts and solemnly charge them in the presence of God to avoid petty controversy over words, which does no good. It upsets, it undermines, and it ruins the faith of those who listen. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved, not to man, to God. Because you are a workman, and we're all tested here by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. But hear this, but avoid all irreverent babble in godless chatter with its profane, empty words. For all it will do is lead to further ungodliness. And their teaching will spread like gangrene. Ew. Run away from and have nothing to do with. I hear that so clearly. Run away from and have nothing to do with. Foolish and ignorant speculations. Useless disputes over unedifying stupid controversies and technicalities. This is in the, the word. Since you know that they just produce strife and then they give birth to quarrels. And the servant of the Lord must not participate in quarrels, but must be kind to everyone, even tempered, preserving peace, and must be skilled in teaching, patient and tolerant when wrong. So just know that if you have to use the word to prove yourself, okay, or if you are arguing over the word. Like, why would you argue over the word? The word is your truth. How foolish is that? Okay, and if um, your choices um, are causing division and discord because of these arguments, obviously that's not of God. So run away from and avoid this at all costs. I think that's it. So, anyway. <laughs> um, I actually, I have a little bit more that I could share because there's just a little bit of time. Let me just read. These are words to the wise. I had wrote these down. I wasn't sure if I wanted to read them or not, but since there's a little time, why not soak in the words of God? Okay. So these are words to the wise, and I just want to like, le I guess I'll end on saying, make sure you get your wisdom, okay? Divine wisdom. And you get your divine wisdom from Proverbs. I mean, you get it from the Spirit of God, as you know, His Word. But Proverbs is all about wisdom. So I just have some really cool um, Proverbs to end on, okay? So senseless people find no pleasure in acquiring true wisdom. For all they want to do is impress you with what they know. A wise son or daughter desires a father's discipline, but the know-it-all never listens to correction. The words of the wise are kind and easy to swallow, but the unbeliever just wants to pick a fight and argue. If you love to argue, then you must be in love with sin, for the one who loves to boast is only asking for trouble. A person of honor will put an argument to rest. Only the stupid want to pick a fight. When you forsake the ways of wisdom, hear this, you will wander into the realm of dark, of dark spirits. And to close, all your brilliant wisdom and clever insight will be of no help at all if the Lord's against you. So Father, we thank you so much we never, ever, ever, ever want you to be against us. Lord, we just thank you that you brought us here. You rescued us. You are delivering us constantly as we sow and sit and receive your spirit. 
And I just ask that every single word that was spoken, your word will become alive in every heart and that they'll be able to be upright before you in spirit and in truth forever and ever until we get to meet you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.